What I decided to do is to talk about, um, first off, I'll give you a little bit of an introduction of where we are with psychedelic research, where we are with medical marijuana. And then, as Ethan started out by talking about this being a multi-generational struggle, that's going to take a very long time, and has already taken a very long time, I have some lessons about careers and social change, ideas that will help you to devote yourself for decades, perhaps, to social change. And these lessons are going to be drawn from six different of my own personal psychedelic trips. <laughs> a way to illustrate the value of psychedelics, but also trying to turn your own inner experience into your political work and how there's a relationship between that. So, First off, to give you a sense, as I said now, that this is this historic moment for marijuana. There's, at the same time, we're doing work on the federal level. MAPS is a nonprofit organization trying to develop psychedelics and marijuana into prescription medicines. And ultimately, that's what we think of in terms of these drugs, is that they have medical applications. They also have applications for personal growth, for spirituality, for couples therapy, for um, all sorts of ranges of uses for recreational uses, and yet, given the, the way that our society is structured, a leverage point is science and medicine. If we can say that there's tools for healing here, that's where our society is most willing to listen. And at the same time, that's where we have models of legal access. So that by focusing on medical marijuana and medical use of psychedelics, we're trying to bring forth the healing potential of these drugs. And at the same time, through the fact that science is like the religion of today, and that the media will promote and widespread report on the latest scientific findings. So there are hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars that are being devoted into anti-drug misinformation, primarily based on fear to scare primarily your parents into being motivated to support the drug war. And there's no way that with the resources that we have in the reform movement that we can ever equalize in terms of that kind of public education. So we have to be strategic. And by doing science and using the magnifying glass of the media, we can spread a different kind of message, a more accurate sense of risks and benefits. And then we can also respond to the concerns that people have in our society about the need for new approaches to healing in the broken healthcare system. So it's a strategic sense. So I don't want to give the impression that I think that psychedelics and marijuana should be medicalized and then that's the end of the story. What we're trying to do is that's just the corner of the piece that we're working on. And if you were to take a look at that chart by Gallup Poll that showed this 40-year trend in attitudes towards legalization, there's a point in time where it really started to shift to more support for legalization. And if you look on that chart, and, and I was going to show PowerPoint, but it was um, too much money to get it up here, and it was much better to keep my in SSDP than to pay for it. <laughs> So the, the chart, though, shows that starting around 1996 is when the attitudes towards legalization started increasing and the opposition to legalization started decreasing. And for those of you who are familiar with the history of medical marijuana, 1996 was Prop 215 in California. Now, the polling has shown, the recent polling has shown that the most significant factor for whether somebody believes in and supports the legalization of marijuana is not do they live in a decrim state, it's do they know a medical marijuana patient. That is the key factor. So when, when people are, are able to, to see that someone that they know is both health and not turned into an addict, and that they can still function as a society, it causes them to question everything. So that's another aspect for why we're focusing strategically 
on being a nonprofit pharmaceutical company trying to develop these drugs into medicines. So you would anticipate that in some ways, since marijuana is a milder drug than psychedelics, that we would be able to be moving forward more rapidly with marijuana research than we are with psychedelic research. But that's not the case at all. And the reason is because there is a monopoly on the supply of marijuana that is held by the National Institute on Drug Abuse. And if you want to do research with marijuana, you have to go to the people whose mission is to educate people about what's bad with marijuana to get it to try to do research with what's potentially good about marijuana. And so that monopoly is the key obstruction for making marijuana into a medicine by uh, the FDA. And that's been going on since the early 1970s when it was discovered that marijuana was helpful for nausea control for cancer chemotherapy. So there has been a successful effort on the part of DEA and NIDA to block medical marijuana research from taking place. And we have the resources. We don't need government money to do it. We just need to be able to get our own independent source of supply of marijuana. So starting in 2001, MAPS worked with the professor, Lyle Crager, at UMass Amherst. How many of you have heard about our lawsuit about the Crager case? Yeah. Okay. Well, for, for those of you that haven't, um, I'm sure all of you know about Rosa Parks, the, the woman that refused to sit up on the bus, and how sometimes you, you pick, Rosa Parks wasn't just a, an average woman who refused one day to get up, to, to give up her seat on the bus. She was an activist with the NAACP. This was a planned protest. The media were there, photographers were there. And so I spent a year trying to find the Rosa Parks of medical marijuana production. And what I mean by that is somebody that was a senior tenured professor at a university, somebody who had never smoked pot, somebody who'd never come out in favor of legalizing pot, and somebody who was an expert in growing and using medicinal plants. And that's the kind of person I felt that the DEA couldn't object to. And after all this, I found somebody even better than the, the script that I had set up. This was someone who had actually worked on secure military facilities developing herbicides for cocaine, trying to, for the coca plant. So he already worked in these highly secure institutions. And we submitted an application in 2001. We have been through incredible struggles with the DEA and they refused to give the license. At one point, they did nothing for three and a half years, and we had to sue them for a reasonable delay under the Administrative Procedures Act. And eventually they said no, that we could sue them. That was a victory again. They said no, that was for us a victory, because then we could sue them on why they said no. Then we had uh, an administrative law judge hearings, and we had pro bono legal representation from the BBC Law Firm, from the American Civil Liberties Union, and we won the case. The DEA administrative law judges are independent of the DEA. They're paid separately. And so we have a history with DEA administrative law judges taking a fair look at the evidence. But they only have the power to recommend. They don't have the power to compel. And so they recommended that it would be, this DEA judge, uh, Mary Ellen Bittner, recommended that it would be in the public interest for the monopoly to end and for Professor Craker to get a license. And the DEA rejected that recommendation. And they did so in a way that was um, sort of betraying the fact that they were biased and that they, they don't care fundamentally if their legal arguments are, are good. They know that even if bad legal arguments can delay a case for years. So we have now played it out. We have hoped that once Obama was elected, that he would reconsider this major, major political obstruction of science. And it goes way beyond medical marijuana. It's this whole idea is, is science in our society going to be fettered by political constraints? Or are we going to let scientists freely do their research so that our policy can be based on facts rather than fears? So eventually what happened, as we all know, is that President Obama felt so attacked from so many different directions that what he decided to do is to focus on 
the issues that were of most concern to him and to let the right wing do whatever they wanted in these other areas. And unfortunately for us, drug policy was one of the areas where he decided that he would not stand on principle. And so what has happened is that the DEA has had the ability, and NIDA had the ability to sort of run riot. It's not that Obama wants them to do these things, but it's that he doesn't want to invest the political capital in stopping them. And so whether we can hope that something would be different in a second term is unclear, because the compromises have already been made. But at least we can hope that. But what we found is that Obama appointed to be the head of the DEA, the same person that Bush had appointed to be the temporary acting administrator of the DEA. And that was really the signal that change was not going to be happening in the first term. So what has just happened on Thursday is that we have now shifted this case from the administrative law judge to the First Circuit Court of Appeals. And the federal court, those judges do have the power to compel, not just to recommend. And so there's um, another lesson in here, which is that there are unlikely allies. So when I was working on my uh, dissertation at the Kennedy School, one of my advisors was uh, the professor who taught part-time at the Kennedy, at the Harvard Law School. And most of the time, he was senior partner at a law firm in Washington, D.C. He used to be the chief counsel for the FDA. He wrote the textbook on food and drug law, Peter Barton Hunt. And Covington Burling is the firm that he's from. Covington Burling represents the pharmaceutical companies, the tobacco industry, and the alcohol industry, among others. They're one of the top law firms in Washington. And yet, they have decided to take our case pro bono, suing the DEA. <laughs> really, really good. And so what, what they were able to do is to show that the DEA um, acted inconsistently in this case. And on Thursday, the DEA responded. And so when you don't have a good argument, you respond that the jurisdiction, uh, the court doesn't have jurisdiction. So that was the substance of what the DEA was trying to say, is the court should throw out this case because of some procedural issue, which we think they're not going to win on. And then they just repeated their own arguments. But basically the story is, we're going to be tied up for years in this court case. Now, we also, to try to illustrate the way that medical marijuana research is blocked, we ended up thinking again to do a new study. And we figured that since we're working so much with MDMA for post-traumatic stress disorder, a lot with veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan, that we would do a marijuana study for post-traumatic stress disorder. There are lots and lots of veterans who are using marijuana for PTSD. And so we designed a study that in all of MAPS's, uh, this is our 26th year, in all of our years, this I think was the most sophisticated design of any protocol. I'm the most proud of this study than ever. And we were able to get permission from the FDA to do this study. And it's the first study also in like 40 years where patients would be given permission to take the marijuana home and do it there instead of doing it in a hospital under observation. was that the FDA and their controlled substances staff said, um, we're very worried about drug diversion. We're going to give these people marijuana. How do you ensure that they will actually use it instead of giving it to others? And that that was the fundamental issue we had to solve. And so we put our best minds together, and we used all of our states of consciousness to try to figure it out. <laughs> and we came up with an idea that satisfied everybody. And so the basic idea was that um, these uh, flip video cameras that used to, or now everybody has them also on your cell phones, on smartphones, is that people would have to videotape themselves, taking the marijuana out of the little safe that they would have to have, and then actually smoking or vaporizing, however they do that. Half would go smoke, half would vaporize. And then, then they would have to uh, show what amount they didn't use, if they didn't use the two grams per day that they were allotted, and then putting it back. And then every day they would videotape themselves, and then when they came every week to get their new supply, they would have to bring the videotape, and then we would have staff watch it and make sure that it was really that. And you know, if we, if we were prepared to go to the next level, which is the kind of 
thing that gym members do is where they have you know, hold up the newspaper of that day just to show you that it's really that day. So we decided we didn't have to do that part. But the DEA, the, the, the Controlled Substance Staff, FDA accepted this. All right, so and this was in April. And in September, what happened was that the National Institute on Drug Abuse, because of their monopoly, has the ability to review protocols in addition to the FDA and the Institutional Review Board and the DEA. And that exists only for marijuana, not for any other drug. So they were able to review the protocol and they completely trashed it. And they had five different reviewers. They're supposed to be independent. Some of them, their comments were word for word what other people had said. So it was clear they shared their answers, they knew what they were supposed to say. And to, to give you an example of how biased the system is, one person said that the problem with uh, PTSD, it's an anxiety disorder, and marijuana can make people have panic reactions. And so therefore, we, it's dangerous to work with people who have PTSD and give them marijuana if they've never used marijuana before. So you can only work with people that have used marijuana before. Now, we had built into our study two four-hour training sessions where we would train people in how to smoke marijuana. <laughs> So we had two of those. <laughs> so if you didn't get out the first time, the second time, you get it. So we thought, that, and then we have all these other safety procedures. But this one guy said, only work with people that have experience with marijuana. So another of the reviewers said that to do a study like this, uh, one of the key issues is how do you do a double-blind study with a psychoactive drug? Because when there's a placebo that's inactive, everybody can tell pretty much whether you have uh, marijuana that's been hit, washed with alcohol and has no THC or CBD or anything in it, or something that actually gets you high. There's not that many people, particularly when you're supposed to do it every day for a month. You know, maybe you're not sure the first day or the second day or the third day. So we have five different groups. Our approach to this double blind is we have five different groups, zero percent, Placebo, 2% THC, 6% THC, another group was 6% THC mixed with 6% CBD. So we would try to understand the role that CBD is playing. And then we'd have 12% THC. And so this one reviewer said, you're gonna have a problem with experienced marijuana users because somehow or other they're gonna know exactly what potency they've got. Uh, now, totally, you know, it's only recently that dispensaries have been doing analytical work where you get any kind of idea of what the potency is on your marijuana. So most marijuana smokers who don't live in a medical marijuana state, or even if they do, if they don't have access to dispensaries that have their own testing facilities, they have no idea what potency. But this person said, because we don't want this double blind to fail, you can only work with people that have never used marijuana. <laughs> And so once this rejection came in, I spoke with a reporter at the Washington Post, and they did a tremendous story, and they in interviewed a spokesperson from Health and Human Services. And that spokesperson said is, this review process has been set up, it's very rigorous, and the only way we're gonna sell nine marijuana to, to MAPS to do this study is if the reviewers are unanimous in their support. So we know from their comments that there's no possibility that we will get unanimous agreement. And unanimous agreement is not used when the FDA has an advisory committee, when an institutional review board is ridiculous to say unanimous, but the fix is it. So the important point for all of you to know is that our failures to make success are a fundamental reason for state-level reform. And that's why we keep doing it. So that there will be state-level efforts and you can say these are necessary because when people come in and say where's the research you can say well the research is being blocked so it's very important that you all know that with psychedelics it's a different story because there's multiple producers of psychedelics and they have um so so we have our own independent supply lsd mdma psilocybin i mean i've never been actually able to um, handle it or see it but it's uh, our supply and we can allocate it to our studies so we have now um, three basic areas. One of them is psychedelics for the treatment of addiction. And we're doing work with ayahuasca and ibogaine in the treatment of addiction. <laughs> and value people once a month for a year. And then 
there's some shaman from Peru that go up to British Columbia and work with First Nations people there who have tremendous problems with alcohol and drugs, and they are providing them with drugs from a different tradition, with the ayahuasca in a spiritual sense, and trying to see if they can help them overcome their own problems. And so that's what we're doing there. So it's very important to have one area of our research acknowledging that there is drug addiction, acknowledging that problems can come from drugs, but that other drugs used in an appropriate way can help deal with drug problems. So that's... Yeah. Yeah. Other area is that in general, people are more scared of dying than they are of drugs. So if we can show to the American public and the general public around the world that psychedelics can help people who are scared of dying, who have anxiety and depression about death, then people will be willing to listen. And so we now have started, the, the, the symbols of the psychedelic religion, uh, revolution of the 60s were Harvard from Timothy Leary and LSD. And so we were able to use working with end of life to start a study at Harvard Medical School with MDMA for cancer patients with anxiety. And in Switzerland, we were able to start a study with LSD for people who are dying from any reason who have anxiety. And in both of these studies, there are some really positive results. So that I think that it's difficult to work with people that are dying. I don't think this is going to be the, the one that makes it through as medicine first, but it's a very important avenue. Then the third, and the one that we think is going to make it first, is MDMA for post-traumatic stress disorder. <laughs> we, we have a um, series of phase two pilot studies, meaning that we do small exploratory studies to figure out different aspects of our method. How do we do a double blind? What is our therapeutic method? You know, what kinds of people um, can we treat? So for example, are veterans with war-related trauma able to be treated with the same approach as women who've been sexually abused as a child or people who've been raped as an adult or somebody who's been in a car accident? And what we're finding is that the therapy we have is independent of the cause of the trauma. So we have studies that then we also want to know, can we replicate our results in different places? Can we do different, um, what is the magnitude and variance of our effect? And as part of that, we're starting a new study in Boulder. So we're bringing psychedelic research to Colorado and at the same time, hopefully, legalize marijuana. <laughs> And Boulder is testing another idea too, which is that we're starting to look at how do we train the next generation of therapists? And also, how do we reduce the cost of our studies? Because our studies are a male-female co-therapist team. And we've had our teams in Switzerland and the U.S. Um, are, have both been actually married couples, but they've both been trained therapists. So now the Boulder study is going to be testing male-female teams, but one of them will be a trained therapist, and the other will be a student learning to become a therapist, working on the required hours to get licensure for either working for free or for, for a low amount. So it's both a way for us to save costs and it's a way for us to train the next generation. <laughs> and, and we have also a, um, a new paper coming out for our first study. We, we showed 80% of people who had PTSD for over 20 years no longer had PTSD after being treated with three MDMA sessions. <laughs> months we evaluated them. So now we've evaluated these patients, 20 of them, an average of three and a half years after treatment. And we found that the benefits have sustained over time. So it's even more important than our first paper. And it's going to be reviewed pretty soon and accepted for publication. And then we, we, we have the remarkable, uh, sad but happy situation of a member of our board of directors, Ashana Haley who was one of the people that uh, was a computer, brilliant computer person who'd been inspired by psychedelics, um, died at age 62, and has left MAPS $5 million Whoa. for MDMA research. Wow. For, for that are here in Colorado, right here, um, he also left a million and a half to the Drug Policy Alliance. Wow. Uh, 
uh, a million and a half to the American Civil Liberties Union, and a million and a half to MPP. And they're putting a bunch of that money here into Colorado. So <laughs> Part of the psychedelics were blocked with marijuana. And now, this, as I said, is NASA's 26th year. So you really need to think long term. This could be uh, generations more. You always have to be aware of the backlash. So when you think about careers in social change, and many of you may focus on drug policy, or I heard about the anti oppression workshop that was this morning, how they're making money. It sounded great. Are there any other areas that you want to work on? And so, now come these brief uh, lessons from my drug trips. <laughs> so the first one is something that you hear all the time. That obviously you have to find something that you're passionate about, and then you have a vision for your life of how it fits in with you to work on. And that may take a while for you to filter this, but it's really, really important to find your passion. And for me, I had one incident, uh, I'll start out with LSD. So when I turned 21, um, I was um, living in Sarasota, Florida. My girlfriend at the time was um, in England studying pottery, so I was all by myself. And so I decided I would take LSD by myself. I lived in a, a house uh, end of the dead end street. And I put on a bunch of music, and I was just sort of listening to it. And you know how with LSD that you get very absorbed sometimes in what you're doing. Yeah. So I just got very absorbed, and then out of um, some of I started hearing this area side of it. And my first thought was, shit, I'm just turning 21, and now I'm going to die. I, we live near Tampa, which is the major uh, Air Force base where there's American uh, bombers, nuclear weapons. And I thought, the bomb's going to be dropping, and this is the end of, the, of, of my life. And what am I going to do in the last few minutes? And uh, I remembered a, a Grateful Dead song where... <laughs> yeah, it was not, um, I don't know if I can call the heat of the sun and died of cold about how your mind can kind of overcome things. So I didn't think necessarily. So I decided that I would just walk towards the bottom and I would live as much as I could in these last few minutes of my life. <laughs> and so I, I walked out the door and uh, I'm walking down, you know, the lane and I'm like to the street and, um, and I'm just noticing the incredible beauty of all the different shades of green, of all the plants and all the shades of blue and white and clouds in the sky and all the sounds of the birds and the squirrels and I can remember to this day how much information there was in life, how I felt now hyper alive and hyper vigilant and just absorbing stuff that I mostly would take for granted. And then all of a sudden the air and siren stopped and the drums started and the guitar started and I realized it was a record that I had put out. <laughs> Yeah, my first thought is, how stupid can you be? <laughs> but then what happened was that I wasn't able to sustain that level of being at that edge of life and death. And that left imprinted me that psychedelics under certain circumstances can really help you feel more alive than you've ever felt before. And that's something... to bring, that's something worthy of life effort to bring into our society, to bring up from the underground. So that helps solidify, for me, the passion to work on psychedelics. Now, because this is long term, the next story comes from a 2CB experience. Yeah. <laughs> and so, but it's really important when you're working in an area that has minimal support to begin with, it's a socially marginalized cause that isn't the dominant paradigm, that you're going to have to struggle for a very long time, and many of your objectives you're not going to be able to obtain. And so if you end up having your goal, if you define success as, let's say, marijuana legalization, if you pick your mission as SCB, it's going to be marijuana legalization, and if that's how you define success, all your efforts up to that, in a sense, are not gratifying because it's only if you succeed. You're looking at your outcome. You're not looking at your process. And so it's very important to redefine success into something that you control because we don't control the outcome. That's something that hundreds of millions of people are collectively going to decide. But you yourself can influence what you spend your time on and whether you spend it productively or whether you try your hardest or just do a half-assed job. So that if you focus on 
the process, you can get satisfaction and joy even if the outcome is left for the next generation or you won't see it yourself. And so where I saw that was one night I took 2CB at a party at college, danced all night, and then I had just an enormous amount of energy. This was a time where I was able to make it to the 5 a.m. <laughs> uh, jacuzzi. So around the sunrise, I went swimming in the pool. And it was locked, I had to climb over. I was the only one there, so we make it in this one. And normally, I would swim a mile for an exercise. And so when I started swimming, I was thinking, um, you know, I should count the laps, I should make it to, to a mile. And then, somehow I just felt like, when, when I do that, it's like, again, if you don't make the whole distance, it's a failure. And so instead of swimming towards a certain number of laps, if I just shifted and I swam towards exhaustion, if just being exhausted then became my goal, then every stroke that I took was a success. Because I was getting closer and closer to getting exhausted. And it didn't really matter. And I had such a feeling of liberation and joy that I swam way more than a mile. But it was that sense of focusing on the process. And I had the same thing, I ran the New York Marathon. And uh, I ducked into a, uh, one of the portable bathrooms right before the start line and smoked a joint. <laughs> <laughs> and, and because of the work that I was doing with maps, I didn't have enough time to practice, to really run enough practice laps. You know? And so I wasn't sure I was going to make it. And again, I was talking to my wife on the phone, and I had this idea that unless I succeed this marathon, I'm a failure. And somehow I figured out right beforehand, just minutes before the starting line, that I was trying, that the, the most important thing was that this was a goal that I was trying for. And whether I made it or not didn't really matter as long as I tried hard as I could. And then every single step was a success, rather than only a success if I made it. And so again, because of that, that freed me up so much. So I was able to go ahead and make it. And it's that attitude of focusing on the process. Now, when you just focus on the process, not the outcome, though, you also run the danger of not critically thinking about what you're doing. You're just trying hard, you know, because outcomes are really important as measurements of how well. So that if you can separate the self-hatred from the self-criticism, then you can have this engine of quality control, even as you're focusing on the process. And so for me, that really came to, to be an aggregating experience that I had. And so when I first did the DEA, <laughs> was back in 1984, trying to block the criminalization of MDMA. And there's a fellow named uh, Biosep, the secret chief, was the leader of the underground psychedelic therapy movement. He's the one that really introduced MDMA into the uh, community of therapists. And he came to me and he said that one of the problems of the 60s was that a lot of the people who were leading it felt like you know, they're enlightened, they have these like, uh, drugs, they're better than everybody, and they weren't, they were blind to their own flaws. And that's in part why we had the, the arrogance and the crackdown. So what he said was, I really need to give you a training session with Ivy. That'll shake you up and that'll help you to uh, be a little bit more mature. So he gave me a combination LSD and Ivy session. And during it, I spent um, 12 hours vomiting. And it was, about this whole sense of, um, I felt as a Jewish person though, the imagery for me was, I was crucified on the cross of my own self-perfectionism. <laughs> and every time that I saw that, I would just throw up. <laughs> and then I would feel fine for a little bit, and then the nausea would come. And so I spent 12 hours like that, and then it was um, transcendence through exhaustion. <laughs> it wasn't that I figured it out, but I just got so tired of uh, beating myself up that I was able to kind of learn the destructive nature of sort of the self-hatred link, but how crucial it is that we have access to the self-criticism. So I think that's something for all of you to, to consider. We want to know always how we can be doing better, and our own deep inner minds will tell us if we're open to that. And the Abbey game was in 1985, and I still think about it today as something that influences me, and I think that's one of the critical um, conditions that has set up maps for the successes that we've had been able to achieve. Now, another part of this is um, accepting your own shadow and not demonizing your opponent. Okay, because that's one of the big things is that if, if you think that you're self-righteous, that we've got, and, and we do have the right cause, but if you demonize the opponent, 
then you're going to make it harder for them to listen. And so I was uh, one time at the DMT with uh, <laughs> Terrence McKenna and, and others when I first experienced it. I had this, um, this, the first thing was uh, this sort of line, this horizontal line, and then the second thing was this vertical line. And then the third thing was it started turning into cubes, and then it had this red color, and then it turned into cubes building like an M.C. Escher painting that was just totally, didn't make sense, and then I was gone. <laughs> and that whole thing took just seconds. And then I was like in this space where I just felt like everything in my head was put there by somebody else. Every single word, practically. Somebody else developed the word, the concepts, how much we are a product of the past, and how rare it is that we think even an original thought. And I thought about a whole stream of history that had been so beautiful, and all the progress that had been made to bring us to this point, that I would have all of these thoughts, and how this was moving towards ever greater openness and freedom and human rights, and how this was sort of, I was a part of all this beautiful suite. And then I had this shocking kind of realization that I was appropriating all the good parts of history, but not the bad parts. And if I was intellectually honest, that meant that I also had an inner Hitler. And for someone who was Jewish and traumatized by the Holocaust, for me to acknowledge that I had this inner Hitler, that I want to control things, I want things my way, it was a massive bummer. <laughs> and it sort of took me right down, and it took me for like a day. So, Accepting, though, the fact that we have our own flaws and that we have a, we're more in common with our enemies than we may think. And we have to sympathize with them as well. So that this DMT experience really opened me up to a sort of humility about what it is that um, we all contain and that we have to acknowledge that. So then the next day, with this group of therapists, um, we did Kennedy. And so the idea here is that not only do you not demonize your opponent, but you need to understand what motivates them and even sympathize. So in the Kennedy experience, I had this sense that I was um, hovering above and behind Hitler as he was giving this speech in an enormous stadium to you know hundreds of thousands of people. And I felt like I was protected above and behind him. And my mission was, on the one hand, to try to figure out what he was getting out of this. What do uh, megalomaniacs, what, what do psychopaths, what, what do they get out of it? How could, how could I reach him? And so I had this rising panic. At the same time, I somehow connected to the fact that I could breathe. And that if I would keep breathing deeply, I could keep looking, and I would overcome the panic, and I would understand. And what I saw was, this hot Hitler salute that everybody then would do back to him. It was like a ball of energy, and he would push it out, so it's like the one to the men, and he would push it out, and they would all do this hot Hitler salute, and it all get concentrated back on him. And then it would go back and forth like that, multiple times, getting bigger and bigger and bigger about this whole collective being, putting all their energy into this one meter. And so it was something that helped me a little bit to try to understand those thoughts that I hadn't had before. And it was trying to really get into the mind of the other. And one of the key things that the training that I had at the Kennedy School was to think of ourselves as the aid to the politician that you're trying to influence. And that you're writing a policy memo for them. And you're trying to explain as unbiased and accurate as you can why they should come to a certain decision. So I think when you think about the DEA, when you think about other people, it's really important the people that you're arguing with to really try to get into their heads and speak in their language. That's what we're doing with the FDA, trying to speak in the language of the FDA. Now, at the same time that you're doing all this, we're working on unpopular conditions. This is my last drug story. <laughs> uh, and fitting that it ends up with an MDMA story. So, what, what I was wanting to leave you with is that in a lot of our work, like working alone or working with a few people, you'll be working against enormous opposition. People, many people will not appreciate what you're doing. I mean, we can, of course, stay within our own little groups and talk to ourselves, but real social change is when we move out and speak to the people on the other side. So one of the things that really helps is that in these moments when you're alone, or in these moments when you're feeling repressed, is to understand that there's this web of connection and love that binds us all. And that you can draw great strength from that. 
And so one time I was uh, camping out in Big Sur on the ocean, and this was involving our, um, our DEA lawsuit. So I was involved with trying to think about the DEA looking at me. And I was also um, at this uh, sad period of time without a girlfriend. And I was working with uh, Brother David Steinberast, who was uh, a Roman Catholic monk, who was trying at the event in the monastery as an aid in meditation. And reporting to the Assistant Secretary General of the UN, who I was also working with, about the spiritual use of psychedelics. And so I was trying to imagine what it's like to be a, a celibate monk. Why would they want, what, what's the advantage? Why would they want to do it? And also try to understand, you know, the DEA looking back at me. And so at some point, now, if you can imagine, the mountains right behind me, camping out, there's this enormous Pacific Ocean roaring, and the high tide went from like three feet from where I was um, camping out, but it wouldn't get me wet. So I was in this protected spot, but in the middle of this incredible universe, with, you know, the enormous night sky, and I felt like I would just fly apart, and that there was nothing holding me there. And that was really kind of scary. And then I realized, though, that for some reason, I wasn't flying apart. I was, I was staying there. And that there was something holding me, and that that was gravity. And then I imagined, somehow, that gravity was like the arms of a woman, and that I was sleeping in the arms of gravity. And there was this web of universal love built into the universe that was supporting me. And ever since then, I've never felt lonely in that same way when I was by myself. And I understood that is what the monastic life is supposed to help you to get to. Beyond where I'm thinking of you know, loving with an individual and trying to get to this universal love. So I think if you can keep that in mind at the difficult moments of your struggle, that will help a lot. And so those are some of the lessons for how to build a career in social change that won't end up in you being burnt out, or you being bitter, or uh, cynical. It's a way to keep moving. And so there's um, one quote that I'll end with. And this is by um, Reverend Howard Thurman. Howard Thurman was a black minister. Wow. All right, okay, yes, yeah. Okay, so Howard Thurman was Martin Luther King's mentor. Martin Luther King got a PhD at Boston University. And Reverend Howard Thurman was his mentor. In 1962, Howard Thurman was the minister who let Tim Leary bring 20 divinity students into his chapel on Good Friday for the Good Friday experiment where half of them got psilocybin mushrooms in church and the other got a placebo. And the purpose of the study was to see if psilocybin could facilitate a mystical experience. And so Howard Thurman was just a very open-minded man. This was before psychedelics were all that controversial. 1962, I did my undergraduate thesis on a follow-up, tracking these people down after 25 years and seeing what they said. And they validated the fact, the people that were in the study, that their experience with psilocybin seemed genuine to them, even after they compared it to non-drug mystical experiences. And the sense of unity and connection motivated them to work on social change because they identified with people. They didn't see differences as a reason to be scared. They saw the commonalities as a reason to appreciate the differences. So here's what Howard Thurman says. Um, don't ask yourself what the world needs. Ask yourself what makes you come alive. And go do that. Because what the world needs is more people who come alive. And that's what it is.
area in my office where it has my uh, diploma from my PhD from Harvard. And I also have two other things. Now we may add this to it. But okay, one other thing is my uh, children's dear graduation certificate. <laughs> graduation at Oaksterdam, and so I have an honor uh, degree certificate from Oaksterdam, and now I'll put my SSDP thing right there as well.